But it's quite interesting actually that space missions and the green energy transition on Earth actually have the same principles. So we need to be a lot more efficient, energy efficient, with actually producing fuels, for example, and a lot more sustainable in the way we make them. Hi, and welcome to ZAM, the Center of Applied Space Technology and Microgravity. We are the operator of the biggest microgravity lab in Europe and our customers come from all over the world to conduct their microgravity experiments here. But we also do all sorts of research right here at ZAM. Besides a moon and Mars habitat, a lab for space microbiology, combustion research and much more, we also have the working group of Katharina Brinker, named Photoelectrocatalysis. Its name reflects its program, but what that actually means, she's going to explain to us now. Katharina, what is photoelectrocatalysis all about? So photoelectrocatalysis looks at the principles that nature uses as well in photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is a process we take for granted on Earth, um, which is essentially the only reason why we exist, why we can live on this planet. Um, it's developed about 2.3 billion years ago. So the idea is that you mimic the processes of natural photosynthesis. So you use materials which harvest light and you use the charges which are created in this, in this process of light absorption for catalysis. And the chemicals we can use, that is, for example, a fuel such as hydrogen. That would be sort of the green hydrogen people talk about as part of the green energy transition. And similarly to natural photosynthesis, we can create oxygen as a byproduct. And that is, of course, very relevant for long-term space missions, where oxygen is the major sought-after chemical, essentially. And what do you and your team do? So we are actually looking at realizing these photoelectrochemical devices for space applications. So this is the long-term goal that we want to build a device and we'd like to send it to um, like a space platform, something similar to the ISS probably. So the idea is that we are basically testing our initial devices in terms of gravitation and the gravitational influence. And this is particularly important because we're looking at oxygen formation. So oxygen formation, or oxygen production is essentially a difficult process to do in microgravity just because of the absence of buoyancy or the near absence of buoyancy. So we do have a problem that gas bubbles are attached to the electrode surface. Basically everywhere where you produce bubbles, they will not move. That's the reason why it's very difficult to also drink champagne in space. Um, because the bubbles, basically, it's very uncomfortable experience to, to uh, yeah, drink anything with bubbles because the bubbles don't go up, basically. And uh, we are trying to develop mechanisms to actually uh, detach the bubbles. So we want to produce oxygen in a sort of a more sustainable way, in a, in a more energy efficient way, by directly using solar energy for the process. And at the same time, we want to sort of modify our surfaces in a way that the bubbles can detach very easily. Tell us about you and your team's recent publication. Yeah, so the big question is, why should we care about oxygen? Um, because obviously the ISS is in space, astronauts are sent up there. So what is the problem for, yeah, for, for oxygen production, essentially? The big problem is uh, that the currently existing system, the Oxygen Generator Assembly, as it's called or OGA in short, is essentially very complex and very difficult to maintain for astronauts. It produces oxygen, but it also requires a lot of energy input. So about one third of the entire environmental life support system, control system, is going into producing oxygen or is sort of an, and maintaining the atmosphere essentially on board a spacecraft or on board of the ISS. So this is a lot. And um, this is, of course, something which is very difficult um, to maintain for long-term space missions. So if you want to explore Mars, if you want uh, to have a habitat on the moon, we actually need to find alternative systems which are more reliable and yeah, which maybe can directly work with solar energy input. And this is basically where we come in. And in the recent publication, we have actually looked at um, how feasible these devices are, at the availability of resources. So what is available on the moon surface? And this is uh, usually a little bit more sun than what we get on the Martian surface. And on the Mars, in contrary, we have a lot of carbon dioxide. So something which is uh, also a big problem, of course, on Earth, which links our research fields very nicely. 
But the idea was then to use on Mars carbon dioxide as a substrate. And on the moon, basically, we used uh, water, uh, which is there as ice water, as part of the lunar Shackleton crater. And the Shackleton crater is close to the lunar south pole, uh, which is the preferred landing site or preferred habitat building site, essentially. So we compared the two scenarios for our device, what happens if we build it on the moon based on, on water, or we basically move over to Mars feed in water and then basically use a lot of the CO2 from the atmosphere. What are the next steps that you are planning in your research? What can we look forward to? So our next big steps are essentially building these devices and validating the theoretical performances we have just calculated, as simple as that. So we're using the drop tower here and basically builds the devices for operation on a, on a short time scale and then we would like to test them in sounding rocket experiments. We hope that we can combine, by showing our results, combining the two research fields of green hydrogen production for terrestrial applications, for applications on Earth, and sort of for long-term space missions. But it's quite interesting, actually, that space missions and the green energy transition on Earth actually have the same principles, the same governing principles. So we need to be a lot more efficient, energy efficient with actually producing fuels, for example, and a lot more sustainable in the way we make them. So utilizing solar energy for making, for example, fuels from carbon dioxide is actually something which is very valuable as well on Earth. Thank you very much, Katarina. We are looking forward to hearing more from you and your team.